Well, good morning, church. Would you agree the Lord is with us? Amen. I feel his presence today. He is so good. Hey, this is a little bit off cue, but man, when you sing those songs, man, who knows that you just see God's faithfulness in your life as you're singing that. Amen. Like, man, I'm not enough unless you come. And I hope that uh, that's your prayer here today, uh, that you know that God is enough in every season. Doesn't matter what season you're in, what season you just came from. Can I tell you, if you don't know, or if you need to be reminded here today, God is enough, amen? But you're here today, and man, you might be in a season, in a, in a valley, in a trial. You say, listen, I want him to be enough. I just am having trouble believing he's enough. And I just want to encourage you. I'm praying that God uh, will speak to you today. But I believe that God's going to show you that he's enough today. Hey, um, we're at the end of a sermon series that we've been in called Fear Not. I can't believe it's the last uh, sermon of this series. But it's been good. Man, it's been good to hear the reports of how God's been moving uh, in this series. And I think the reason that it's really spoke to so many people is because fear, it runs rampant in our culture and society. I joked week one and say, like, when have you ever turned on the news and you turned it off? You're like, that's just what I needed today. I'm really encouraged. I got orange juice in the news. I'm good to go today, right? No, you, a lot of times it's about what's going on in the world and how bad it is. And I know that that is real at times, but I just believe that we have the living hope in Jesus Christ. And it's not just Easter. I believe it's every day. And so I believe in the midst of the fear, we can have a peace knowing that as we put our faith in God, we don't have to be dominated by the spirit of fear. That's what we believe as Christ followers. See, Isaiah 41 10 says, don't be afraid unless, no, no, no. It just says, don't be afraid. That's, that's what we need to know. Don't be afraid. But Dylan, you don't know what I'm going through. You're right. But God does because he says, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. I know you are not enough, but I know that he is enough. And life will kick you in the teeth a time or two for you to realize, you know what? It's just I, I can't do it. I'm not strong enough, and I don't care who you are and, and, and how educated you are, how strong-willed you are. I'm telling you, there will come a point in time where you, you find yourself in a season of life where you just say, you know what, I can't do it. It's in those moments, while it is scary at first, but it's in those moments where I feel like we get to have this amazing experience where we say, God, no longer am I in charge. I want you to be in charge, and I'm going to trust you in everything that I have. And can I just tell you, God's ways are way better than our ways. Can I get an amen? Amen. Like, if you've been in the church a long time, you know that your way wasn't a good way. But when God's way came up, man, it was so much better because he is Yahweh, right? Pastor jokes. Like, he is so faithful. But if I'm being honest, there's some of you here today, you're reading, you're reading the scriptures, you're, you're singing the songs, you're like, man, I just haven't seen that. I haven't seen God's way be very good. And, and it's my prayer that you'll be challenged of, of, of asking yourself, have you actually followed God's way? So today's message, the last message of this sermon series is called Fear No Future. Everybody say future, please. I'm out of curiosity. This is a judgment-free zone right now. Uh, raise your hand if the thought of uncertainty in the future stresses you out. Raise your hand. Some of you are lying in church. That's okay. You can put it down. The idea of, I don't know what's going to happen, right? We can process the past, right? We can process the, 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 the present, but you can't process something you don't know yet. And so what you have to do is you have to give God your future, And that's why scripture says, don't worry about tomorrow, for today has enough trouble of itself, right? Man, this morning, you know, we get here early to set up everything, and just one thing after another, it just began to not fall in line. I'm like, oh, I can get frustrated. And then I'm just reminded, you know what? Dude, God's enough. And it can be something so petty as a trailer, and it can be something so big as a health issue. But what I know is God is enough in every season. But what we have to ask the question is, do we allow fear to run rampant within our future? Well, what if this? And what if that? And what if? And what if? And what if? And I got news for you. You can create a whole what ifs and be dominated by the fear of the future, the fear of the unknown. But here's what I want to tell you today. If God created you and saved you, don't you think that God can sustain your future? Like, think about that. He created the heavens and the earth. He saved 
saved you. And if you can process it, God's a pretty big God. Your resume versus his resume, you don't stand a chance. Like his intellect to your intellect is mind boggling. And so if we believe that he's so big enough to create the whole world and believe that he's so personable enough that he sent his son to die for us, don't you think that God will sustain us in the future? But I realize that it's hard when the trials come. And there are a lot of times that we begin to see that maybe our faith isn't as strong as what we thought is because oftentimes we're okay with God being God as long as God does everything that we want, aka God in our box. And so if you're struggling with the situation of, of, of the discerning the future today, welcome to the club, number one. Number two, here's what I wanna tell you. If God did it then, God can do it now. But rather than waiting for the trial to come at you, and listen, I'm not this person, a pessimistic person looking for a trial everywhere around you. I heard one mentor you know, tell me one day, you know, this is before we started the Well Church, he said, hey, can I pray for you? I said, man, I just, just pray that God would humble me. He goes, brother, you don't want that. I said, why not? He goes, because he'll do it. I said, what do you mean? He goes, how about you humble yourself so that way he doesn't have to humble you? I go, I like that. So when you say, God, give me patience, how's he gonna give you patience? Through a trial a lot of times, right? And so rather than, than waiting or, or looking for a trial, here's what we do. Before the trial comes, we're just gonna trust God with the present, and as the next situation comes, we're gonna look at all that he's done then and know going forward, he's still gonna be with us. So Father, we come into prayer one more time this morning, and I feel your presence. God, I, I've prayed that people would um, just fill the seeds here today, but more importantly, that your spirit would fill the seeds. Not just the seats, God, all around. Father, I pray that people don't leave here talking about the preaching and the worship. I pray that they talk about the spirit of the living God. Lord, you've been faithful in the life of our church. God, you've been faithful in this new campus. God, I believe you will be faithful in the future. But God, there's some people that have, have a hard time trusting you with the future. And so God, would you be God in this place? We love you and pray this in your name. And everybody said a big. So at the, at the beginning of COVID, I knew it was real when March Madness got canceled. I was like, okay, this thing's real, right? And then all of a sudden you hear these speculations, rumors that this might get canceled. Well, like everybody who you know, began to wonder what their job would look like um, as an evangelist at the time, um, I began to wonder what's gonna happen to all my events. And we had been doing evangelism for about a year or so and uh, God had opened up doors, um, some big doors big conferences, big schools, big, I mean, it just, camps all summer, all these things. I mean, the best season of evangelism was about to come up. I mean, just prominent conferences, prominent universities. And I'll never forget one of the events that I was really looking forward to uh, the most, this school, they called me, this college, and they said, hey, Dylan, sorry, we're gonna have to cancel this event. I'm like, hey, you know, I totally understand. And obviously, way more important than an event and a job was, was people's lives at stake, you know, and so I'm not trying to make light of that, but that was my job, and, and so I was like, okay. And then, all of a sudden, it just became humorous, not really funny. Day after day after day, I got call after email after text saying, hey, sorry, we're not gonna have cancer, we're not gonna do this. And so in one moment, I go from being so booked out, I couldn't fit anything else in my schedule, to man, we are gonna, God has blessed us, to I have no idea what we're gonna do. And I know there's people in here that you could re relate to that news. And so I remember um, I was getting squeezed in a whole new way. See, evangelism was a big leap of faith for us. We knew God was calling us to do that, but it was scary. But I had seen God do amazing things, and I knew God was gonna continue to bless the well, but I knew that, Lord, would you show up? And he did. I mean, moment after moment, he showed up. But here, fast forward a little bit, you know, a year or so later, I'm getting squeezed in a way where I'm like, I don't know what's gonna happen. And about that time, we just, you know, we, we had to sit down and the drummer here today, Stephen, I don't know where he's at, but Stephen Rippy and his wife, Emily, are good friends of, of Maddie and I. We were at their house and, and Rippy is a part of my board and, and I just said, man, listen, I don't know what's gonna happen. And Stephen's a very reserved individual, but when he speaks, you listen. And I felt, because, he, he, he's, he, because he's so reserved, he doesn't get you know, very just emotional, he doesn't get very wound up, but he just, I felt like the Lord gave him this word, said, Dylan, God will do this again. I said, I know, I'm the preacher, I got that. No, I didn't. It was in a moment, I just said, yeah. 
And we began to dream. We began to believe that if God could do this at the beginning, he wasn't shocked by COVID. And he could sustain. And I don't have time for all the stories, but I'm here to tell you, God not only provided for us the opportunity to preach the gospel and to sing in so many various ways through technology and things of that nature, God doubled the income. He began to do things in the midst of a trial, in the midst of the unknown, in the midst of the future. Where God, I thought you called us to this. I don't know why this happened. Man, in the midst of that, God showed that he is faithful. But the truth of that statement is say, Dylan, but that, didn't, that wasn't my story. I lost my job. More, more devastating than that, you lost a loved one. And to that I say, I am so sorry. And I don't know why that happens. I mean, I can give you the origin of that. But here's what I do know. Even in the midst of our trials, and even when we don't have the answers, here's what I say. God is still faithful. Because I know what it's like, in the words of Paul, to have a lot and I know what it's like to have a little. I know what it's like to watch God perform miracles, and I know what it's like to feel like I am there, saying, God, where are you? But here's what I can say in my 12 years of being a Christian. God is faithful, church. And, and when it comes to the future right now, I think we would all agree there's a lot of unknown and uncertainty in our world. Can I get an amen? And is, it, is this side right, or is this side right? Is it their fault? Is, there, is it their fault? Here's what I know. I don't know it's, if it's his fault or their fault or whoever, but what I do know is I'm putting my faith in God and my future rests in his, in his hands. And so our focus here today is this. God's faithfulness in the past gives us a hope for the future. AKA, if he did it then, he can do it again. And, and you need to get that deep down within your bones because I got news for you. The Bible says not if trials happen, but when they happen, you need to be prepared to put your faithfulness in God in the midst of the trial, not just after the trial. See, Psalm 77, 10 through 11 says this. It says, and I said, this is my fate. Have you ever just like woke up one day and you go to make some coffee and those who don't drink coffee, like my wife, we're praying for you still. You get coffee on, it doesn't you know, work out really good, and then your breakfast isn't good and things like that, and you're like, that's it, this day is ruined, this is my fate, right? But then there's sometimes you wake up and it's, it's a little bit more than coffee spilled on you and your breakfast not being good, it's how am I gonna pay these bills? It says the Most High has turned his hand against me. In this moment, he's saying, listen, God has, has literally forsaken me in this moment. But here's what happens. The very next verse. But then. Come on, somebody. The word preaches better than any preacher. But then I recall all that you have done, O oh Lord. Come on, somebody. Somebody here needs to just, in that moment, but I'm going to recall this day might not have started good, but it can end good. But I'm gonna recall all that you've done because I remember the wonderful deeds of long ago. Here's what I wanna tell you up front. There will be days where you will worry and have doubt. Well, didn't the scripture say don't doubt? It does. But it's also true here in the midst of a mighty man of God saying, listen, I feel like God's against me. I've had moments where, God, what's going on? What, like, like, why is this still happening? And, and listen, if you're not careful, that's why the, the word of God tells us to take every thought captive, because if you don't take it captive, you'll run with that and fear will dominate you, and then that will lead to bitterness and anger towards God. But within the midst of the doubt, within the midst of a, in the worry, because I'm a realist, but within that, you need to recall that God is faithful. One of the most powerful tools that we have is to reflect on God's goodness. And, and you know, I don't wanna get too much into this, and I hope that we can insert this in a sermon series someday, but the statistics in this room of your daily devotions, of, of your, your spiritual disciplines, if you will, is, is pitiful. 
I want you to think about this. In the midst of the worry that you do every single day, how much time do you spend in prayer? How much time in the midst of the anxiety of, of oh my gosh, what happens if, uh, you know, if this or this happens? What would happen if you used that same amount of time or even a fraction of that time and invested that in prayer? If you invested that in the word of God, I got news for you. If the only time that you're getting in God's word on Sunday, you don't got a chance. Because the world and the enemy is there all the time telling you, listen, you need to be fearful about this and this and this. But I got news for you. The God I serve isn't just here on Sundays. He's there on every day, especially Mondays. And I know that, listen, he is with me every step of the way. Not because my, my pastors and my mentors tell me. It's because God tells me. So what's your, what's your devotion to God? Oh, I'm busy. Oh, just wait. We, we got a sermon series coming for you. We're all busy, brother. We're all busy, sister. But the question is, and not even a question, here's what I like to say, we make time for what's most important to us. If you can make it to every ball game, you better make it in time with the Lord. Not one amen, it's all right. I have this thing called, and I want you to write this down, pun not intended here. Listen. A journal, anybody just love the journal up in here? Like, raise your hand. Don't, it's okay. You feel like you're not, you have that one proud journal. It's like, that's me. Got 20 colors for every different area of my life, right? I knew that was a spiritual discipline that I needed to do, but I just didn't do it. Number one, my handwriting is like a two-year-old, so who wants to be reminded of how bad your handwriting is? But number two, I was like, ah, I don't want to do this or this. But I heard this thing, and here's what I want you to write down. It's called a Levenger journal. It's a little expensive. They might have cheaper versions of it. I was listening to a leadership podcast, though, and this pastor was talking about a Levenger journal. It's a five-year journal where you can see on each page the, the previous year. So there's five years, essentially, and then you get to see what you were doing on that day a year ago, okay? And so I got one of those, and I'm in my fourth year within this journal, and every day as I get into journal, I look, not now, since I've been doing this for so long, I get to look at the previous years and see what God has done. And as I got in the habit of journaling, and if that's not your thing, that's okay. But as I did that, every day I'm reminded that God was faithful even when I didn't know the outcome. And so I'm not telling you that you need a journal. I'm not telling you here's my, how much time you need to pray and how much you need to read. Listen, that's not my thing. But here is what I'm telling you. If you know that what you're doing right now is not working and fear and anxiety about the future is paralyzing you, do something different. And rather than wasting your fear, invest that in prayer. Invest it in reading the word of God and know as the trials come, I am ready to go because I know that my God is faithful and I'm going to recall on what he did then and that's going to help me have faith in God going forward. But if you don't have these things in place, you're just waiting for life to punch you in the mouth. Put on the full armor of God. See, a very well-known verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, I probably don't even need to put it up there. You can probably just quote it. But for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good. Can we just praise God that his plans are good? Well, right now my situation's not good. Well, listen, the enemy can get in the way of that. You can get in the way of that. But I got news for you. God is not the enemy. He is good and only good. And not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. And I feel this strongly this morning that somebody needs to be encouraged I just have this image in my mind, I'm not saying it's stuff say the Lord, of a mom in here today who needs to be reminded, not just for you, but also your kids, God's got them more than you've got them. And that's not to condemn you, but that's to, that's to encourage you. All the pressure of the world's not on you. Aren't you thankful for that? Praise God that even when we should have listened to Dr. Phil or someone like that, that's a joke, that like God is there. And, and what's crazy is the times where I knew that I should have done this or should not have done this, and Dylan got in the way. You know what's amazing? God used that situation for good and gave me a future, and he made me optimistic and hopeful, not in a blind sense, but in a faithfulness sense, where I am reminded that even though if I get in the way, God's ways will prevail every time. 
Only though, only, we believe theologically at this church, only if you submit your plans to him. Are you God or is God God? Because if you try to micromanage everything that you do, and listen, I'm all about task, I'm all about lists, I like it, I love it. But within all that, I'm here to tell you, you cannot itemize everything that the world throws at you, so what you need to do is do what only you can do and then give your family, give your job, give your future spouse, give your current spouse, give your kids to God and say, Lord, I'm gonna trust you more than I trust me. And what happens is you begin to be reminded of God's faithfulness. But here's the context of Jeremiah 29, 11. I'm out of curiosity. I know I've had you raise your hand a few times, but just humor me one more time. Raise your hand, truly, like don't do it if, if not. If you've come to this scripture before when you were in a trial, raise your hand. Okay, so several of you, you can put it down. I have many times. And that's the beauty of scripture. He can use one context and apply it to so many. But here's the context. The Israelites were about to go into exile, captivity, aka away from their homeland, in slavery, not a good place. And the reason that was happening, because it, it says that God's plans are not for a disaster, so why are they going into captivity? It's because of their own decisions. We believe that God gives us free will and that he doesn't force us to love him. And so because of their own freedom to do whatever they want, they kept on ignoring the promptings of God and eventually they found themselves in a place where God says, okay, you wanna do what you wanna do? Let me remove my hand and my favor. Doesn't mean that God didn't love them anymore, but he says, you wanna do what you think is best? Go ahead. And it led them to captivity. And, and he's telling them, listen, this is gonna happen. And before I move forward to the good news, some of you here today need to be reminded of this. When you just think, hey, listen, God's gonna make it all work. See, I hear this oftentimes. Well, that was God's will for me to do that because now I'm here and, and, and the life I have now, that must have been his will. Here's what I need you to know. I gotta correct your theology. God's will is never for us to sin. Would you agree? You're not gonna find it in there, I promise you. Well, God made it all work together for the good. Yep, because he's good, but it doesn't mean that he ever had that for you. Some of you believe you're gonna do what you want and God's gonna bless it because that just was you know, his plan. No, that was your plan, and some of your plans got you into captivity because different sins have different consequences. But here's what you need to know. There's the truth, here's the grace. In the midst of that, God will give you a future and a hope. But I screwed up too much, I know, but God's so good. Well, right now I'm not really seeing how good he is. So what do I do? Here's what the word says right before this. It says, if you seek me wholeheartedly, you will find me. Listen, we, Maddie and I were at this church assessment all weekend and she was being assessed as she's getting credentialed and we're learning about our strengths and from Strengths Finder. And won't get into all that, but I was reminded this week as I'm looking at my strengths that I have this weird thing about me, and, and there's some of you in this room I'm close with, I know you're the same way, where when you're backed in a corner, first of all, if you're not careful, you'll be egotistical and think, I got this, but you don't, but God gave you that strength, and so if you sanctify and say, God, I can only do this with your strength, but as I'm in against this corner, I don't like to back away or say, oh, I don't know what's gonna happen. There's something within me, it's like, let's get it. Let's go. Now God has shown me time and time again when Dylan said let's go, it didn't go very well. But when it says, God, I know that you're in charge and I can't do anything, but I'm willing, let's go it changes everything and right now some of you are backed against the wall, whether that be emotional, physical, spiritual or mental and what you need to know is if you seek God, he will draw near to you and he will give you a hope and a future and some of you need to not give up hope here today but be reminded, be hopeful that God's plans will prevail, amen? 
but you've got to ask the question, who's in charge of the plans? I'm going to move quickly, but Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, trust. Everybody say trust. Trust Trust in the Lord. That's easy for some, not so easy for others. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Not just some, church, all. Do not depend on your own understanding. Here's the Dylan Dylan Living translation. Quit trying to manipulate everything. That's hard for some control freaks. Some of you have so much control, you don't want to admit that you're not in control because you would lose control by admitting that. But seek his will in all that you do and he will show you which path to take. If you trust and if you seek, he will show. Isn't that good? I just, like, truly, if we believe what the word says, like, what would happen here today, here in the life of this church? Man, we, we launched in September, what is that, six, seven months? Not good at math, don't correct me. We launched in September, and God is growing this church. It's amazing hearing what God's doing. But I want you to think about this. And of all the situations represented here today, what would happen if a small percentage of people completely, with all of our heart, with none of our own understanding but God's, seek God with everything that we did? Would we all agree that we would see more revival and more of his presence? Would we agree? I, I believe that. Man, and I have a burden this morning. And maybe it's because I was around a bunch of pastors this weekend. And I see a lot of these people that are young in their ministry journey and they're getting started. It was at the same training centers seven years ago where 22, three year old version of myself was sitting there and I'm the the youngest in the room by far. And I said, Dylan, why are you here? I just said, I think God's calling me to plant a church. And some snickered. And some just looked like, come on, man. But I believed, I had the audacity to, to believe that I heard him. And I trusted him. And I trusted him because I knew that I didn't get myself here. It was only him. And if he got me this far, he'll get me that far. And true story, I'll never forget this. He didn't tell me at the time. There was another church plan, planner who was there. He said, he looked over and said, that kid can't plant a church. And God corrected him and said, I can use anybody. The irony of that story is he's no longer a church planner. Got hit, no, I'm joking, I'm joking. He's, we're friends now. You're like, you're a bad person, don't know, we're friends. We snicker now. <laughs> but yesterday I was reminded, God's done a lot in six years. Worship team, you can come. He's done a lot in six years. I'm not talking about church growth, guys. Stay with me. Land the plane soon. 16 year old. about to drop out of high school. Never studied a day in my life. Spent a lot of time in ISS, you would have thought I studied, but never. This is a side note, one of my history books was in there, it happened to be the book that I needed to do well on a test, and I aced it 100%, and they said, Dylan, they didn't know the book was in there, they said, Dylan, this just tells me if you would just focus, you have it in you. And I just smiled and said, thanks. They had no idea. I just cheated on the whole thing. <laughs> They're like, we might need to leave you in here. I'm like, as long as you bring me the book, we're good. <laughs> but the reality of it is, man, I was never smart enough. I was never good enough. I will never be smart enough. I will never be good enough. I will never be the most talented enough. I've busted my butt, but I'm here to tell you, I can't not trust in God because I'm just reminded every stinking day I'm not enough. Don't you do a good job? 
I know. But it was 16 years old. God, I trust you right now. 18 years old, call me to ministry. I can't do this, but I trust you right now. And I sought his word, I read and I read and I prayed and I was reminded on the daily, I'm not enough. I'm not enough unless you come. That song wasn't out yet, but I just knew I'm not enough. My first day of college, just shaking. Everybody had MacBooks and I'm like, man, I just got the cheapest one Walmart had. The pastor kids and then just me. And then I get hired to be a youth pastor and say, you're too young to be a youth pastor, but we're gonna try. And God somehow used me. And then it came where he said, we're going home to plant a church. I said, okay. And people said, man, how? I said, I don't know. And God spoke to Selena's heart. I just realized that he was doing this together and called this to evangelism. I said, we can't do it. And he began to put Marshfield on our heart. I said, God, that door is not gonna open unless you do it. And it looked like it wasn't going to open. Even when I'm trying to make things happen, it made it worse. And I said, fine, maybe I didn't hear you, but as we waited on the Lord and as we sought him, he showed us what path to take. God, do you want us to go to Oregon? Do you want us to go to Florida? Do you want us to go here? Keep doing evangelism. He said, wait on me. He said, Dylan, have I been faithful? Yes, sir. Then trust me, son. Some of you need to be reminded you were nothing before God got you. But man, if you seek him and you trust him, he will show you what path to take. But the reality of it is there's so many of you in here today, you don't seek him on the daily and you definitely don't trust him on the daily and you have no idea if what you're doing right now is even what God has for you because you've never checked in with him. Well, I'm just good at this. Praise God that you're good at it. But does God, there's that burning sensation in you. People say, well, it's just a job. Listen to me, that is a lie from the pits of hell. Dylan, you're a pastor. Of course you think that yours is what God's called you to. I'm just doing this. No, no, no. God has given you that ability so that way you can make an impact where you're at. But you need to ask the question if that's where he has you. Some of you need to know right now what to do. Would you agree? as a parent, as a spouse, as a worker. What do I do? You pray, you fast, you read his word, and you seek him and he'll show you. But here's where we end today. Like what happens when you are faithfully seeking him? What happens when you know you're doing what you need to do but it just doesn't seem like God's there. What do you do? And as we end, there's no better scripture in my opinion than Daniel chapter three. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're in exile, like we had read about earlier. They're, they're living in a foreign land, forced to do things in a foreign way and a foreign king who has a statue built and it's everybody's responsibility to bow down before that statue, to say, King Nebuchadnezzar is our king. But about that time that they make this mandate, not a mass mandate, a worship one, they blow the horns and say, hey, it's time to worship. Millions of people would, would lay down and worship King Nebuchadnezzar. But you got these three guys that were from a different land who serve a different God. He says, no, we ain't doing that. We serve the one true God, Yahweh in his way. This makes King Nebuchadnezzar so mad. And he has this blazing furnace and 
He gets it so hot that when the workers came in to throw these guys in, and they ended up dying. But before we get there, verse 17, knowing that their life is on the line, knowing that their back's against the wall, they're against the ropes, about to get thrown into the fiery, or fiery furnace. Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, which tells us this, it doesn't matter how godly you are, you're gonna have a trial because this world is God, the world's God is a little G God and it's called Satan. That's in the word. It says that Satan is the little G God of this world. Symbolic language there. They're being faithful, but yet they're still in the midst of a trial. And it says this, I love it, man. It says, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God who we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. Hashtag get some. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you your majesty, that we will never, ever, ever serve your little G gods or worship little W, the gold statue you've set up. What, he's, what they're telling him is, that's my God who I live for. And I know I could just bow down real quick and look like everybody else and do what everything else is doing and just say, hey, me and God's got this thing on the side, you know? Some of you, you, you come to church, but man, all throughout your, 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 your week, man, you and God got your thing. You're bowing down to the things of the world like everybody else. But man, God's looking for a people in the midst of the fiery furnace, in the midst of the lion's den saying, I serve one God. And I believe that God who did it again is going to do it now. But if he doesn't, I'm going to trust his plans and not my plans. And no, when I see him face to face, I said, God, you are my God. You are faithful. Fear no future because you are faithful. And I wonder if here today, some of you are about to get thrown into a fiery furnace, whatever that might be, and you're looking anywhere and everywhere for something to give you meaning, something to give you satisfaction and fulfillment. And the question is, is God enough when you don't see that he's enough? So as we end, God's faithfulness in the past gives us a hope for the future. What are you going through? I don't know, but I do know this. You're, you have a decision today to say, man, you know what? Maybe I haven't checked in with God and say, is this the way that I'm supposed to go anymore? I want you to stand, please. Heads bowed, eyes closed right now. Number one, I feel impressed to do this. No one's looking. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm not looking for lip service and God's not looking for people to raise their hands. He's looking for people to say, that is my God, not little G God, but big G God. I will faithfully follow him. Even when the world goes one way, I will follow him. I will trust, seek, and believe that whatever path he shows me, that is where I'm going. I want you to raise a hand right now, wherever you're at. And put it down all over this place. The altars are open if you wanna come down and pray. I'm gonna invite you to do that. But the other category, the altars are open right now if you wanna come. People all over this room raising your hand. Here's my second category though. This is not for Dylan, this is between you and Jesus, but me as the messenger today, I just feel so checked that there are parents in this place who have been parenting and have read every book, listened to every podcast, read every article, and think that they can do it themselves. And I'm not saying we don't do homework, but I'm saying there comes a point where you gotta trust your kid's future with God. And not just your kids, it starts with you because you can't give what you don't have. 
There's some people in here, you've been having a life where maybe even success, and you assume that worldly success correlates with God's success, and I got news for you, that's not true. Where you've never even thought to ask, hey, are you working at where God wants you to work? I'm not telling you to quit your job, but I'm saying if, if that's getting in between you and the Lord and it's taking you away, I mean, tell me what's God in your life. Is your kids schedule God in your life? Well, you, you'll understand, Dylan. No, I won't. What happens? Here's where I end. What happens? Whatever your biggest stressor is, what would happen if in this place, your biggest worry, I, I want a kid, I, man, I, I want the job, I want a spouse, I, I want money, I want, all those are good, but it can't be the main thing. What if it doesn't happen? Is God enough? Is God only enough if your future looks like everything that you want it to be? Or is God enough if, if the future for your life is what he wants it to be? So right now, not everybody. Right now, if you have a worry of the future, what college to go to? Am I gonna be single forever? Is my spouse gonna leave? Is my health gonna be there? Are my kids gonna be all right? We all have them. Whatever your need is, and when you identify that, I want you to lift it up. No one's looking. Just lift it up to him, symbolically. Hey, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. We know that he's good. We know that he's faithful. Keep your hands up. We know he's faithful. And his plans will be good regardless. But what if it doesn't happen the way that you thought? What happens if it doesn't? What happens if, it's, if it doesn't look anything like you thought? Is God still faithful? That's how you know you have a genuine relationship with him. If you know in this place, regardless of the outcome, regardless of what it looks like, I believe that God is faithful. That's how you know you're where you need to be. And so I don't know who you are or where you're at, but I'm gonna invite you to come down and pray. And I want you to get next to that fiery furnace and say, regardless of what happens, I fear no future because my 